I'm Rachel Johnson, co-host of the Educals Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking with Joe Ryman, PhD. He is the president of the Group for Immigrant Resettlement and Assessment, or JIRA. He is also a psychologist in private practice and is the co-author of the books Immigrant Concepts, Life Paths to Integration, and Immigrant Psychology, Heart, Mind, and Soul. Oh, uh, there's so much to learn today. Thanks for listening. And oh, by the way, it'd be so cool if you went to my website, uh, stephenmaletto.com slash reviews and left a review. Maybe said a few nice words and uh, five stars. Mm, that would be so cool. You could also uh, join my email list by just uh, putting your uh, email address in the uh, in the, the little box there for it. Uh, and by the way, I don't sell or distribute any email addresses, so please keep that in mind. And then the last thing is if you could, you could help me uh, by supporting Supporting the podcast by uh, you know donating a dollar or two um, through uh, buy me a coffee uh, and you'll see that little app there on the website. Uh, help me keep up to date with my equipment as well as some of the software that I use. That would be so cool. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy the show. Well, I think language was a, a primary difficulty, and again, this is not you know I'm, I work with a lot of people from East Africa and different populations from all over. All over over the world and I have to again say that my transition was relatively easy compared to what they have to deal with but uh, the school system was not entirely prepared for somebody without any English skills uh, and and uh, so on so I came in and uh, I was back in the back of the class reading Dr. Seuss books uh, trying to figure out what Tur- Yertle the Turtle was all about <laughs> and when I then got, I think at the end of fifth grade or into sixth grade, I took a standardized test with the rest of the class. And after that, things got amazingly easy. You know, I had had maybe half a year of uh, English and German gymnasium, which is the the prep school for university bound folks in that system. Uh, But then I had taken the standardized test and obviously I had no clue what I was doing. I was filling in little Scantron sheets this way and that way, making pretty patterns. It's the education podcast, your favorite show with lots of groovy guests and they share what they know. So crank it up the tin and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading K-12. Teaching, learning, leading K-12. Teaching, learning, leading Twelve, ah, ah, with Dr. Joe Ryman, PhD, serves as the president of the Group for Immigrant Resettlement and Assessment. He's a, a psychologist in private practice and is the co-author of several books related to immigration. For the past 25 years as a psychologist, he has provided direct clinical services as well as organizational, community development, and research consulting. Much of his work focuses on culturally and linguistically distinct populations. Over his career, Dr. Ryman has also been a researcher at San Diego State University's Graduate School of Public Health, has taught undergraduate, master's, and doctoral level courses at several institutions, and has authored or co-authored a number of articles in peer-reviewed academic journals. As president of the Group for Immigrant Resettlement and Assessment, Dr. Ryman leads a team of clinical and social psychologists, researchers, career development specialists, leaders of community-based organizations, and additional members who have expertise relevant to immigrants, refugees, and others subjected to forced migration. Its mission is to create and implement psychometric measures that help integrate immigrant groups into the host countries. For more information, make sure that you go to immigrantscreening.com, and I'll have that link in the show notes. An immigrant from Berlin, Germany, Dr. Ryman earned a B.A. in psychology and an M.E.D. in educational psychology from the University of Texas at El Paso. He then earned an M.A. and Ph.D. in clinical psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology, now Alliant International University. He resides with his wife, Dr. Dolores I. Rodriguez Ryman, who is co-author of their books, Immigrant Concepts, Life Paths to Integration, and the book Immigrant Psychology, Heart, Mind, and Soul. They live in Chula Vista, California. Joe, thanks so much for being on the show, and say hi to everyone. Hello. I appreciate being on for the opportunity to meet with you and talk to your audience. Well, 
Great to have you here. And uh, uh, let's start with this. You came to the U.S. at age 10 by way of Berlin and have lived near the U.S.-Mexico border most of your adult life. Can you talk about what the transition was like, I mean, as a 10-year-old and um, coming to the United States? When uh, kids, certainly I and other kids that I knew, think, thought of the United States at the time, we were thinking of the New York skyline. Uh, you know, we were thinking of big cars with hot tail fins. Nice. And so it was a, you know, there was a, an anticipation that things were going to be wonderful. Uh, some people seemed a little bit crazy to us over there because I remember uh, we had a family in our neighborhood that had a, one of those big old street cruisers, and they would pile into the car, uh, drive, you know, a quarter of a mile down the street to, to where the mailbox was, pick <laughs> up their mail, and drive all the way back, which to us was like, don't these people have legs and feet? <laughs> but <laughs> All in all, our, our uh, perception of the United States was very positive. And so then uh, we made the trip. Uh, we were pretty lucky because my, unlike a lot of people I work with, uh, my family was essentially imported to the United States because my father had certain expertise as an academic in electron microscopy. And so he was brought in based on his skill. Uh, so... Yeah, it compared to folks that I see on a regular basis, the transition was relatively easy, uh, especially since as a little kid, you're basically a little sponge that, that is able to absorb all kinds of new information in a way that maybe us older folks can't or at least have a harder time with. But uh, it was all positive from, from that perspective. My, my first night in the United States was watching TV in a hotel room in LA, uh, watching Have Gun Will Travel and Gun Smoke. Nice. And not understanding a word, <laughs> but having fun anyway. So that was the start of things. That's awesome. That's, that's really cool. The, uh, uh, so as you're transitioning from um, at 10 years old and getting a little bit older and so forth, what was one of the most difficult parts of making the U.S. your home? Well, I think language was a, a primary difficulty. And again, this is not, you know, I, I work with a lot of people from East Africa and different populations from over, over, over the world. And I have to, again, say that my transition was relatively easy compared to what they have to deal with. But uh, the school system was not entirely prepared for somebody without any English skills uh, and, and uh, so on. So I came in and uh, I was back in the back of the class reading Dr. Seuss books, uh, trying to figure out what Tur Yertle the Turtle was all about. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, and when I then got, I think at the end of fifth grade or into sixth grade, I took a standardized test with the rest of the class. Uh, and after that, things got amazingly easy. You know, I had had maybe half a year of uh, English and German gymnasium, which is the the prep school for university-bound folks in that system. Uh, but then I had taken the standardized test, and obviously I had no clue what I was doing. I was filling in little Scantron sheets this way and that way, making pretty patterns. Uh, but then... Uh, my easy time in school didn't last because my parents came back from uh, open house aghast because these highly academic and educated folks had a son who was in, quote, adjustment classes, unquote, which was a polite a way of saying I was in classes that were not for the, the biggest and brightest kids on the wor in the world. Uh, so I had to take a bunch of courses over again. And then by the time high school came around, I was in advanced. But it was a little bit of a transition in the process. Gotcha. That's, uh, you know, it, uh, I can only imagine, because uh, we're going to talk like you've uh, um, referenced a couple of times to some people who have a slightly different experience, but at the same time, it's still <laughs> your tr your own transition. I mean, I, I know uh, um, when I was in... Uh, 
college and uh, and uh, well, actually going back to high school as well, um, had opportunities, uh, neat opportunities to uh, um, become friends with uh, students who were on uh, exchange programs from Germany, and uh, it was really cool because I that's I I always wish that I had gone beyond college and been able to travel some because my my life took me different directions, but I. Uh, um, I'd spent a lot of time uh, with uh, um, learning um, German in high school and uh, and in uh, in college, and wanted to take it the next step. So I that's how I got access to then being able to connect with uh, um, people who became uh, my friends who were um, in, in exchange programs. And anyway, the point is, is that it was one of the things that it taught me about a lot about was the differences in the. The, the type of English that uh, they spoke a lot of times <laughs> versus the the way we spoke. And it was always kind of interesting. And I can only imagine how that could cause some issues sometimes, especially as you got older and you might throw out a word or two that, uh, um, and my, my favorite one was my one friend who, uh, who was talking about asking where we dwelled um, and, we were kind of like dwelled <laughs> and, <laughs> and I've always thought about that, how as, as his English was progressing and so forth, but there was still that high level of the language that he was learning where we weren't using words like dwelled. And, uh, and did you run into, into things like that or were you too young as the, the you're making that transition? Well, in my uh, brief experience in German English classes, uh, I learned a little thing about the frog in the well and uh, my body flies over the ocean and words like satchel, which I have to admit, I don't use every day in the States. So it was a very British English uh, scenario. And, but again, at 10 years old, I actually hear the word satchel every once in a while. I say, oh yeah, I remember that. (laughs) But it, it wasn't a good preparation for the American style of English. Gotcha. That's uh, it, it, it's just it's just funny because I always think about uh, what I was learning and a good thing that I, you know, <laughs> where that's when I was having you know someone talking to me about dwelling and other types of words. I was thinking about so what are they hearing out of my mouth? <laughs> but yeah, um, but uh, um, good. So I appreciate you going down that <laughs> that lane for a minute. <laughs> the uh, you know you've helped. You know, many immigrants, um, including ones fleeing war-torn countries. What drove you to make this your calling? It was not actually uh, this major game plan in my earlier career. Uh, You know, my wife and I came out from El Paso, Texas, in order to get our doctorates. And the fantasy was uh, to live in the fancy part of town, make lots of money, and, you know, happily ever after. Uh, But... I think the, our backgrounds, our joint background, she is originally from Mexico. And so she has that experience, which is, again, uh, certainly different than mine in a lot of ways, but also has some commonalities. Uh, we kept seeing what was going on in the world and what the need was in terms of uh, psychological services and research and so on. And, uh, you know, what the atmosphere, honestly, was at certain times in schools uh, when it came to the Mexican-American student population. Uh, and we said, okay, this is an area that we have lived experience in, that we're also learning about academically and, and clinically, and this is where a need is. And it's, it's kind of interesting because, for me, different population, different parts of the world were always... Uh, fascinating uh, because it was a it was a nice place to learn things and so then we fell into the the process when we were at san diego state university together of doing a couple of needs assessments one was after shortly after 9 11 for the local middle eastern east african population and then another one was uh for a, a mostly rural and Latin American population uh, county here next to San Diego County in the Imperial Valley. 
So the, all of those things combined and just kind of one thing fell on top of another one. And we were doing some contract work for Survivor of Torture International for a while. And so we found a home in that arena. Uh, you know, the saying is life happens when you make other plans. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And so in some ways that happened with us, but I have no regrets. Uh, we are where we're supposed to be. And so I'm good with that. That's cool. Very cool. They, you know, our, our focus today is, uh, are your two books written by you and your wife, Dolores. Um, one book is immigrant concepts, life paths to Im integration. And the other one is immigrant psychology, heart, mind, and soul. What's the main focus of these two books? Uh, and why'd you guys write them? So we have a combined uh, set of experiences that involve our own personal lived scenario uh, that include academic experience, including having done research publications relevant to immigrant groups and having done clinical practice, both of us. Um, my wife's practice is largely Spanish speaking. Uh, so we have the personal, the clinical, and the academic. And that's, I think, we're not the only ones on the planet who have that, but that's kind of an unusual scenario. What we were hearing in the media and in, in, in other places was basically lacking some of the stuff that we've been dealing with for quite a while. And so we said, do we sit on this experience and you know just have, keep it to ourselves, or do we try to share it with other people uh, and so we decided to share it with other people. Uh, I think that was, you know, the, the primary motivation. Uh, I think you may have some uh, people in your audience that are in academia. And I think there are, most people are willing to acknowledge that uh, a lot of stuff that's in peer-reviewed research journals makes it through the, 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 the filters of academia, but doesn't necessarily reach the broader population. And so this was our way to say, okay, we want to have a venue to transition what we think is important in, in the research and the, the, the clinical arena and put it into a framework that the general population can understand and potentially learn something from. I love that because that's, uh, I, I was listening to a guest lecturer talking one time at uh, university of Georgia and he was, uh, Talking about how in education, a lot of times it's like a hurricane where up on top where all the research is being done and all that sort of stuff, it's it's all busy and and uh, the wind's blowing and the, the sky's falling out. But then but then down at the bottom of the ocean, it's all quiet and reserved. And then, <laughs> yeah. I always thought that was uh, something interesting because right, right along because he said a lot of people don't read those researches that are actually the practitioners. And I thought that was cool. So that's neat what you're talking about because that is something that happens a lot. We don't. We don't see or read or have access to, or, you know, and some of them are written in a way in which, uh, you know, it's more research oriented. And, uh, and uh, so it's, it's nice to have it uh, um, where it's, uh, and, and I'm trying to get myself out of a, a, a corner here. I don't mean to say that. Uh, you know, it, it, we try to make it a little bit less jargony. How there we that? go. That works. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. Cause that, boy, I really worked myself in that corner. Um, but the, uh, yeah. that, and, and that's cool. And it's so important because like, uh, you know, just a note, my, my own experience, it has to do with, it goes back a ways, but my grandfather, um, was brought to this country with his seven, um, to the U S with his, uh, seven, um, siblings. And, uh, um, his father was a railroad man in Italy and, uh, the, uh, and I don't mean a conductor or anything like this. He was actually, you know, one of the the, the workers on the, on the trains and keeping them running and stuff like this. And he brought his uh, children and wife to the U S cause there had to be more to it in, in 1904 and looking for a better time and came through New York and went to Philadelphia and then ended up in Chicago. And, and, uh, and that's where that's what began. And my grandmother, his wife, uh, who eventually becomes his wife, like a year later, her family decides, you know, it, Forget they, they came from the Rome area. My grandfather came from the um, southern part of the boot, and uh, um, it, her family brought them through New York and Philadelphia. Ended up in Chicago somehow. They didn't know each other in Italy or anything like this, and um, they become childhood sweethearts and eventually get married. All that sort of stuff, and it's kind of funny. And 
you know, and it's, uh, and they had the different aspects that went through, um, uh, you know, becoming an immigrant is there's not an organization like what you're talking about <laughs> at those times. And, uh, uh, matter of fact, the, the only real organizations like that were, uh, you know, you might do them favors and, and they come calling sometime for another favor or something like that. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Cause as I read what you're talking about and so forth, I mean, well, one of the things that uh, my grandfather, um, his first name was Angelo, but uh, um, I always, people always called him Andy. I was his buddy. We hung out with him all the time and stuff. And, and uh, as I got older and, and when I got older, I asked him questions. I said, uh, why do you, why do they call you Andy? And uh, he said, well, it, there was a time when I was trying to become more, um, more American than, um, uh, than Italian. And so it was a more American name. And so that helped me get jobs. And then eventually my grandmother also, you would hear her call him Jim. <laughs> and I said, now, all right, now, okay. I understand how Andy came out of Angelo, but where Jim come from. And that was actually a, another step in trying to make it more Americanized. Um, so that would help him in the job world and such. And, uh, uh she was the only one who ever called him Jim, but it was, a. Uh, that was a neat sort of thing. But, and, and so the, where I'm going with all this stuff is that, uh, you know, the time frames are obviously a lot different, but some things similar and, uh, um, about, uh, the need for supports or, uh, what happens. And so Joe, let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, your books. I mean, who are you thinking that, that should read them? Who are they for? I mean, what, what, it, what are your thoughts about a target audience here? So we have a combined approach to that. We, we want to talk directly to immigrants uh, because we have some things that, that uh, are aimed specifically at them in terms of strategies they can use around acculturation and other factors. We want to talk to uh, people who work with immigrants. Um, this could be anything from a, attorneys to people in community-based organizations. We had some contact with the U.S. Office of Refugee Resettlement recently. And so but there are lots of different folks who work with this population, uh, some more remotely, some directly on the ground, face-to-face. And then uh, we also wanted to address, you know, an audience that uh, of anybody who is interested in talking about this uh, topic in a more nuanced and fact-based approach we see a lot of snippets on tv and other places that may not really reflect uh the the totality and truth of what's going on and we wanted to reach those kind of folks so uh the combined audience some people have told us well you know you're spreading yourself a little bit too thin but we think it takes the kind of the 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 understanding of each other and the cooperation and coordination of different services and so on to make things happen. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. That's excellent. I, all right. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the trends right now. I mean, what, what demographic trends are you seeing in regard to immigration in the U S I mean, what, what, what are those numbers and those the bigger groups and so forth? What, what's, what's going on? So uh, what we hear uh, in the media day in, day out is basically about large groups of people coming to the U.S.-Mexico border and wanting to get across. And uh, traditionally, that's been mostly people from Mexico. But at this point, uh, there's a large group from Venezuela. There's a large group from what's called the Northern Triangle, which is basically Central America, Honduras, and, uh, and El Salvador, and uh, Guatemala, and so on. And there are also people coming in from Haiti, uh, who in some cases have lived in uh, South America for some period of time, but politics are getting, getting hot over there uh, in, in terms of the anti-immigrant sentiment. And I've seen stories of people who ended up in the southern border that are from uh, from in addition to Haiti who are from East Africa and Ukraine and and Russia and all kinds of other places even from Somalia so it's a pretty broad-based group of people that have are kind of on the move uh, the other part of the equation is uh, in Europe uh, there's a lo- fairly large trend of people coming from North Africa to uh, 
France to Germany, uh, trying to get through Greece and so on. And so those are the, the common trends I see that are particularly noteworthy at this point in time. Gotcha. They, you know, one, at, uh, one time in my career, I was a principal of a school that where 31 languages were spoken. And uh, it was very, uh, um, lots of recent immigrants, lots of recent, uh, you know, stories about where they came from. We had a um, population that uh, was, uh, um, the largest population was from Central America and the biggest part of the, uh, Central America and the biggest part of that population was from Mexico, but uh, um, from many different countries. But then as well, on top of that, we had uh, um, Arabic, um, primarily from uh, Jordan and uh, some Saudi and uh, so forth. And then uh, from various other parts of the world, um, everything from some Baltic states to uh, um, some East Asian um, countries. And it made for an interesting, uh, the, the, some of the stories that they, they would tell and uh, stuff that they were dealing with. And uh, I, uh, by the way, also left out Haitian, Jamaican, and uh, um, we had um, from different African nations as well. And uh, w one of the things that uh, became quite obvious to us was that we had to have nights that were dedicated to helping parents understand uh, the society in which they were living and working. Um, for example, like uh, um, how to, uh, how banks work and how to get a loan um, or how to, uh, how to go about if you wanted to buy a house, um, what are some of the channels that you would use and such like this. And so there are many other topics that we were doing, but those are a couple of them. And that leads me to, to this. I was wondering if you could kind of talk about, uh, you know, your book's, in them, there's some practical guidance to immigrants for success. I mean, what are some of the common issues that new immigrants have to overcome that you, you, you found and talk about? So I think one of the major arenas is the process of acculturation. The, historically, the, the way of trying to look at that was to say, well, as people, let's use the U.S. as an example, as people come in and learn the language and do other things, then they become more Americanized and by definition lose their original cultural perceptions and orientations and so on. We now know, and I'm oversimplifying things a little bit because people have talked about this in much more detail, but uh, there, to, to make a, a short version of things, there are at least four major ways that people deal with acculturation. Uh, one is that traditional model. In other words, uh, I will give up where I came from in order to be where I, where I am. Uh, part of that is probably the, the, the name thing that you mentioned uh, earlier. I have a friend from uh, Serbia who now goes by Bob. I don't think that was his name <laughs> when he left Serbia. I'm Joe, even though my, my real name is Joachim, which nobody over here can pronounce. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it's those kind of things. So uh, leaving behind where you, where you came from in order to adopt new uh, ways of doing things and being is one approach, but it's not the only approach by any means. Uh, another approach is to be bicultural, which means basically that you don't necessarily have to give up who you are at a core in terms of your personal identity, in terms of your ethnic identity and so on, but you do learn the sort of the rules of the road. In other words, you learn the language, you learn uh, how to negotiate the bank systems and the healthcare systems and all kinds of things like that that you mentioned. And so you're competent basically in, in both arenas, both in terms of where you came from and where, you're, uh, where you are now. Uh, some people do not do that. They, they, they don't really acculturate in the way we think about it. They don't learn the new language. And that's a choice. I'm not going to evaluate that choice. But from a practical standpoint, uh, it does limit kind of the opportunities that somebody can engage in that, that, that broader society may be able to offer. Uh, and then there are some people who, who come up with something completely different that is some mix of the both cultures, but also has stuff that, that neither of the original cultures has. You know, in, in LA and in parts of San Diego and Chula Vista, there's a big low rider community. Uh, I would think that you're not gonna find too many low riders in Mexico City. 
so, you know, this is a very much an American Chicano type of thing. And it's, it's not part of the original cultures on both ends of the equation, but we're kind of doing our own thing here and we're good with that. So those are some of the, the four major approaches. Uh, I do also think that there are, you know, one of the issues in addition to acculturation and really in connection with acculturation is that there are people with qualifications and skills that come into the country who are not able to apply those skills readily in the U.S. Uh, people who were trained as a, uh, doctors and attorneys uh, in their home country who have who were in fees, reasonably high level positions. Uh, don't have those credentials accepted in, in the U.S., and at least not without a whole lot of work and, and sacrifice. And so that's certainly a challenge. Uh, we learned a little bit through COVID that sometimes removing those barriers can be a good thing because we're going to benefit from having people who are really highly trained helping us in uh, emergency rooms and so on. Uh, and um, access to health care, is, is, is a challenge because oftentimes perceptions around health and uh, how what systems are and services are available to you, even down to medications, uh, are very different from country to country. Not all medications are legal in all countries. So, you know, if you have meds from home, suddenly they may not be available uh, in the U.S. or vice versa. So those are all some of the pieces that we address. Very nice. You know, it's, uh, there's, there's so many different aspects of it, especially, you know, it's, uh, depending on, um, you know, if there was like in, in that school where I was principal, there were some communities that, uh, were, that grew out of like one or two families coming together and, uh, and they kind of took over little neighborhoods <laughs> and, uh, this became their, an enclave, but also kind of their protection and help them with knowledge. Um, as they were, you know, working in the communities and uh, needing uh, more connections to do whatever business it was that they did. And I, I can only imagine that uh, with someone coming to the country who doesn't have those types of um, support mechanisms, that uh, the need for support is is tremendous. Um, any, any thoughts about that? So there have been some efforts uh, to integrate services and approaches. Uh, for example, uh, San Diego started an effort a while back. I think it kind of got a little bit dinged by COVID as most things did, but uh, there was a, a, an effort called uh, Welcoming San Diego. So that involved uh, people from the local government at, at various you know, city and, and county and so on, involve private business, include CBOs and, and other stakeholders. And basically the intent was to come up with an integrated plan that uh, um, takes immigrant populations and um, provides resources across a number of different arenas in order to help people with the kind of support that you're talking about rather than just, you know, okay, go out there and find your way. Right. That's, and that's a, and, and many do that and things may work out eventually or, and some, it, because of whatever helps them, you know, there's, but having some sort of support network is, is so important, I, um, especially to protect from some of the dangers of some of the, you know, just the different things that happen in those that can happen in the communities and such that uh, kind of harm's way comes to mind. <laughs> um, yeah. Pop. I mean, we, uh, it's a, it's a somewhat separate, but also connect the topic that what you hear in the media and it's, it's, I understand the concern. I think it's legitimate, but uh, any system can get overwhelmed. And given the number of people that we've recently had uh, along the U S Mexico border, uh, our basic premise in the books, based on what we've seen outcomes both in, in Europe and in the U.S., is that bottom line, when we help immigrants uh, get to where they need to go here in the U.S. and other places, then uh, everybody benefits because immigration can uh, sustain and drive economic engines of their adopted countries. 
So if we do it right, we have a win-win situation. We're not just trying to be nice, but we are actually benefiting from the immigration process. That said, uh, eating too much cotton candy can not be necessarily good for you. So I do think we need to think about how we can work with this scenario a little bit better than we are right now, because uh, you know, if we get overwhelmed by the huge numbers, that's not going to be good for either us or the immigrants trying to get through. Gotcha. Gotcha. The, you know, one of the things that comes up and it's the words in some of your writings and stuff like this, and it, and, uh, and it just comes to mind as I, as I read your thoughts and so forth um, that, you know, there's a, there's a real important role that becoming resilient plays in, in an immigrant's transition to the U S can you talk a little bit about uh, the idea of, you know, the, the need to be resilient in, in making this transition? So I think part of the motivation for bringing up resilience as a, as a chapter, for example, in the first book was to say, uh, yes, resilience is needed and resilience is basically defined as a, as a way to be able to be adaptable and to be able to kind of control even emotional reactions and so on in order to be effective. Uh, and when we think about needs that immigrants uh, have, we also have to say that as a group, in many cases, immigrants tend to be a really resilient bunch. And uh, there is an example that, that is in the research literature called the, the immigrant paradox or the Hispanic paradox. It's had a bunch of different labels, but the paradox is always part of the language. And what that basically means is that in some cases, immigrants do better in their new world as compared to the local population. So given all the challenges uh, they face and uh, what they're having to deal with uh, coming to a new country, how is it that sometimes they do better? In fact, as a, as a trend that they can do better. And um, what we, we think we know about that is that uh, there is something about some elements of culture which can be very supportive. And that goes back to what you mentioned earlier, that if you have a community around you that, that's able to be supportive to you, uh, then that is, is reassuring, uh, that is going to give you more confidence that you can be successful. And uh, so positive aspects of culture uh, are uh, help resilience and help some of the trends we're seeing. And... Uh, you know, that's just a certain amount of intestinal fortitude that some folks have, because if you look at the journeys that they went through in order to get here, which includes, you know, tromping through the jungle and something, uh, you know, and then in Central America, uh, in something called the Darien Gap, which is about 60 miles of, of no, no real roads, lots of mud, lots of snakes, and, and all kinds of other stuff. And then uh, being in Mexico and getting on top of a train that's called, uh, in, in one expression, the train of death for good reason. And another one in Spanish, the la bestia, which means the beast. And basically what happens if you're sitting on top of that train, it's not a commuter train, there are no plush seats. Um, so you're sitting on top of a freight train, the cars of a freight train. Uh, you're going through most of Mexico on that. Nighttime comes around, you fall asleep, you roll off, you're gone. Ne people next to you, because it's dark, it's nighttime, may not even be able to tell that you're gone because, you know, it's too late. Uh, plus all of the things that can happen to you along the way, including extortion, human trafficking, sex trafficking, you name it. Uh, by the time you get here, uh, you better be pretty resilient co considering all the stuff that you've managed to survive. Uh, so that may be another part of the, the, the equ equation. We've, unfortunately, it's, I hate to say it, but in, in a lot of ways, we get the survivors of those kind of experience, which is means that we get the resilient, most resilient of the resilient showing up. 
Gotcha. That's uh, you know, there's, there's journeys, and I can only imagine how some of them have make it as far as they do, and then uh, and, and then to include some of them who are coming through worn, torn countries where they're avoiding bullets and things like that as well. And you know, it's uh, um, it's quite a incredible journey that does need you to be able to put up with a lot of stuff and overcome it. I only imagine. I you know you. You have the uh, um, the group for resettlement and assessment, uh, GIRA. Um, can you talk a little bit about its purpose and and uh, what it's doing? So, what we got together in addition to writing the books, what the the original plan for GIRA was to uh, come up with a number of different projects. I'll use one particular project as an example, uh, and that is that. Uh, we wanted to put together a psychosocial measure that looks at all of the dimensions that immigrants really need in order to be able to be successful. Uh, so those include uh, occupational transitions. They include both mental health and physical health. They uh, include acculturation and where you are with that and willingness to acculturate. There's actually resilience as part of that equation. So if I'm coming in as an immigrant and I take this measure, uh, some cases it would have to be verbal and so, because if I don't, if I don't have limited education, I don't, uh, then that might be tough to read. But uh, however that menace, the measure is administered, uh, then I come up with a, a portrait of, of who I am and what my particular needs are. And somebody helping me with this can say, okay, you know, the next person in line may have a pretty different profile, but Joe Ryman needs this, 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 and this. And so we can ta tailor a, a service plan towards the individual rather than having a more blanketed approach. Uh, so if you can do that individual by individual, that would be one, one application. Uh, on a broader aggregate data level, now I'm getting into the academic language, uh, on, a, on a broader level, if you pile all the, the information together, if I'm running a social service agency, I may be able to see certain trends. Uh, and those trends might be, well, we get a lot of requirement for X, but not as much for Y. And we have limited resources. So the way we're going to go move forward is to say, uh, when we have our money and we we divide it out in little piles, we're going to designate more stuff towards what we're finding is a common need and less stuff that may still be a need on specific occasions, but overall is not quite as high as the other arenas that we're, we're trying to address. So right now, the, the measure is complete. We're in data collection after being out of academia for a while and back into, you know, uh, getting uh, participants and uh, about to run fancy statistical validation analyses, hoping all my statistical software on my computer still works. And so uh, we're moving forward with that. Actually, this, this kind of concept has been applied in a bunch of other different situations. Uh, one I can think of is Fun facts about my career, I spent eight years working in juvenile hall as a psychologist and later as a program manager for county juvenile forensics here. Uh, the fancy language around working with kids is uh, that, that they have, quote, criminogenic needs. There's a good word for you. And what does that mean in English? It means that we're trying to keep kids from getting into the adult system. So there was something called a risk and resilience inventory that was developed for San Diego County, which does a similar job to what I'm talking about with this measure in that it identifies what a particular individual requires in order to kind of get organized, get out of the legal tangles that they've gotten themselves into and does not make it into uh, the adult system, which is much more warehousing than what we do in juvenile hall. Gotcha. It's, uh, um, so it, I can only imagine just the different types of stories that, uh, you run into, um, with the organization as they're, as you're doing what you do to, to try and figure out, uh, I guess how to help. Is that, uh, 
good way to say it. And uh, good stuff. I, you know, Joe, if someone wanted to follow up and connect with you and or learn more, where would you send them? Well, I, uh, they can contact me directly at Joe at Immigrant Screening. Uh, that's probably a good start. Um, depending on the community that they're from, there are certainly uh, local organizations, let's say in San Diego and in other places, that will help. Uh, I used to be the board chair for Somali Family Service of San Diego, and they do good work in, in that population. So it, it again, it's, it would have to be fairly individualized uh, in terms of what kind of needs they have and, and where I would send them. But uh, in terms of treatment, that's another big thing. We recently, well, it's been a couple of years ago, but it's still fairly recent in, in the Somali population. We learned by having our ear on the ground, not through any formal stats, but just by knowing the community that that over a two-year period, five young adult males had completed suicide. Uh, so, you know, one's too many, but five's a trend. Right. And so basically what we did in response to that is that we, we reached out to the community and we said, uh, let us talk a little bit about mental health and how to get services for that. And it's not... It's not as scary as you might think. Nobody's going to call you crazy. Uh, your, your information is going to be kept confidential. So here's what you can expect uh, if you tap into the mental health system. Uh, and then we talk to providers. And occasionally I've still done training for my old employer, county employer, Health and Human Services, and said, okay, uh, if people come to you from various populations, how do you effectively treat those folks? How do you consider culture and the process and, and so on? And so then you're, you're reaching again both sides of the equation because they have to work together in order to be, a, you know, to, to move forward. So connect with local resources and, and we just have to go from there. Gotcha. The, you know, uh, um, we're, we're coming up to uh, the close now and we're, uh, um, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask you that are just questions I like to ask my guests. And um, if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, um, to start there. And uh, just the first one I have goes like this. How do you overcome feeling like you may want to quit or give up? Uh, I can't afford to quit or give up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, there are times when uh, certainly on the clinic practice piece, you can you know, it becomes a little bit more challenging because uh, some people have what I call the Popeye syndrome, which is I am what I am. That's all I am. In <laughs> other words, I'm not going to change no matter what you tell me. Nice. And that can be a little bit frustrating. But then there are also those nuggets where you you understand it's, it's different than being able to build a house. If, if I'm in construction, I can go buy that house for the rest of my life and say, look, I have built that. I don't necessarily always know what happens with my clients, but there are times when, when I do know, and those are very gratifying and, and so on. Uh, part of our effort was to, to working with one person at a time or a family at the time is important. Uh, but part of our effort with Jaira and the books was basically to reach out, try to have a broader impact beyond what one on one. And one-on-one -on -one is certainly important, but it's it's, it's trying to reach a, a broader audience. So uh, some of that keeps us going. You know, it's a it's a, a thing we have a passion about. Straight out of uh, uh, my doctoral program at San Diego State, I I got a grant, which is unheard of that somebody straight out of school gets a grant, it, and it was at kind of the height of the popularity of cigar use. And it was an important topic because cigars can kill you and uh, laryngeal cancer and you name it. But my problem was that I didn't give a, you know what, about smoking and cigars. I know I'm not going to do it, but it's not my passion. You know, that topic was just not my thing. So you got to find what you, what you love and that keeps you going. That's awesome. I love that. Uh, 
Good, good stuff. I, last question. Do you have a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it? And what would you say if given a chance to say thank you? Okay. So uh, people tend sometimes to find a while to reach their, to find out where their talent is. And, and uh, I wish I had talent in a lot of other areas that I don't. Uh, and so I have to have to resign myself to that. But I, and it ended up much to my surprise that I had, especially given an immigrant experience that I had a, a talent in the English language. And uh, the way that was fostered was uh, in part, not the only place, but in part in, I think it was probably the eighth grade or so in what was then called junior high school is now middle school. There was a English teacher by the name of Mrs. Zolan. And uh, what I remember about her teaching, what I continued to use is that she said, okay, if you want to get a point across in writing, let's say, you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. And that's kind of stuck with me. I tend to be speaking and writing wise, uh, kind of an inductive reasoning type of dude, which basically means I start out over here and there's this fact and there's this fact and there's this fact and there's this fact and I, I tie them all together and this is what it means. Uh, problem with that can be that in certain circumstances, if people get bored and, and I don't get to the point till much later, then I lose the, the audience. So I got to tell them the thesis ends up front. And I still have to remind myself to do that. But uh, I did learn that from her. And I do appreciate the fact that she has, you know, teachers are a little bit like, like uh, psychologists, because oftentimes you don't necessarily know what happens to your students over the long run, because other than, you know, we class reunions where only the popular kids show up. You, know, you don't really know what happens to your students. And so I would, I would, if she's still around, which I hope she is, but I don't know, um, that I would like her to know that I do remember her. I do remember that, and I still use her advice. That's awesome. I love it. Love it. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for sharing your books, Immigrant Concepts, Life Paths to Integration, and Immigrant Psychology, Heart, Mind, and Soul. What timely, important, and practical information you've provided in your books. Wishing you the best in all you do. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right here. The opinions expressed on Teaching Learning Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.